you know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason an event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Ferry Podcast, where I will sit down and converse with the superstars, the overachievers, the masters of our craft. Each episode will be a deep dive into their personal philosophies, their habits, the tools they use, and the secrets to not only their success, but overcoming failure as well. First, find somebody you can mimic, then find somebody you can stand, and then try to focus on one style until you master that style. So if you say, I can't do something, well, you're absolutely right. But if you say you're going to, you're absolutely right with that too. People say that you shouldn't define yourself by your work. That is not true. You know what Dave Farley does when he's, you know, lucky enough to be at the World Equestrian Games? I'm watching other people work. Yeah. I don't think uh, we do that enough. This podcast is for all of you out there who share my passion for the job and the desire to always improve. These interviews will put you in touch with the inner workings of the role models we all want to emulate. So let's get to it. You know, there's only so many hours in a day, and it's a matter of what you do with them. Welcome, everyone. In this episode, I got to sit down with Barney Cummings at the Ontario Farriers Convention in Orangeville, Ontario. This was a first for the podcast, recording it in front of a live audience. And I did make a mistake in not putting a microphone in the crowd to pick up their applause. I apologize. I will endeavor to do a better job next time. The lesson has been learned. Back to Barney. Barney has been a shoer for over 40 years. He has traveled extensively to do his craft, including a time as the team farrier for Canada. He is well known and respected in Ontario as an expert in dressage. He is also well known in the farrier world for his many projects meant to educate farriers, including his most recent being a member of Foot for Thought. Barney provided me with a pamphlet that had some more information on his bio, so I will read parts of it here. He has spoken at the Ontario Veterinarian Medical Association, the Canadian Association of Equine Physiotherapists, and the Ontario Back Symposium. In serving his passion for ongoing education, Barney has created and produced a series of web-hosted educational videos to inform the horse enthusiast. Barney is a member of the Association of Professional Farriers, the American Farriers Association, and the Ontario Farriers Association, and takes advantage of the many opportunities these organizations have to continue his interest in further education. Barney is also one of the first people in Ontario to set up a multi-farrier practice. This was back in a time when it was almost unheard of, and it was quite a successful project. He now just works with his son, but there was a time where he had many members working with him, and I have run into many of his former apprentices who are now working on their own and, and running their own shows. The podcast was advertised for the Ontario Farriers Convention as a discussion on this multi-farrier practice, so you will see that we do dig deeper into that topic. And we started out with a song by Barney, because as most of the audience wasn't aware, Barney is also a recording artist and has two albums to his name. The one did very well on the European charts, and in Australia, I think he told me. So he's obviously a very multi-talented fellow. I was very grateful to have the opportunity to sit down with him and and have this conversation. I learned a lot about him and learned a lot of lessons along the way. I hope you do too. Please enjoy. So welcome, everybody. First thing, I wanted to say thank you to everybody from the OFA board. I just said earlier, I saw Mark and Erica and many of the other members running in and out of the clinics. When we were all sitting there enjoying it, they were working their butts off to make it all happen. They did a lot of work over the weekend. Best event I've been to for the OFA so far. Also would like to thank Dr. Sam, Dr. Andrea, Hannah, and of course, Luke, for 
being the clinicians this weekend and helping educate us all. Thank you. When we're done, we'll have questions. So if anybody has any pertinent questions for Barney about running a multifarrier practice or how you can get him to sing at your uh, next event, you can ask him at the end. This is the very first live recording of the Mullins Farrier podcast, so it's a new format for us. We'll just kind of play it by ear and see how this all works out. So who recognized that voice of the country crooner we just heard over the PA? That was Barney. Uh, He's a man of many talents. Welcome, Barney. Thank you for doing this. You're welcome, Brian. Thanks for your interest. So you're a country singer. You're also at the Globe and Mail, I learned from Justin a little while ago. What made you settle on horseshoeing? Well, everybody comes with a story, right? So uh, that's uh, part of my story. It's a long one. But essentially, it did have to do with music. I was uh, uh, burning the candle at both ends, and uh, I wanted to play a lot more than I was. My weekends were full and rehearsals a couple times a week. Really, I... I had fond memories of meeting a farrier when I was in high school. He was my uh, girlfriend's uh, farrier at the time. He was from London, Ontario. So when I realized that I couldn't continue at the level in music that I cared to and still work nine to five and make all of that happen, I really, I did a, a checklist of things I wanted out of my work life. First of all, it made sense to be self-employed if I had any notion that I could regulate my own hours to my own purposes. I wanted to be self-employed. I decided I wanted to work outside. It would be wonderful to work with animals. I wanted to work hard. I wanted something that was physically demanding. I learned very quickly how physically and mentally demanding it is So I just remembered back to Jim Baskerville, the London farrier. As coincidence would have it, I was listening to, not that any of you would remember, but I listened at that time to a a radio station from Richmond Hill, Ontario. I think it was CFGM. Coincidentally, again, there happened to be a horseshoeing school in southern Ontario. And they were running ads. So I hear the ad. I think of Jim, make some phone calls, buy a couple of books. I'm going to do my due diligence, do some homework. Ultimately, I ended up uh, signing up to the Canadian School of Horseshoeing in Mount Albert, which is where I now reside, or just outside of the village. How much of this story do you want? (laughs) Uh, Two days before the... uh, course started, I get a call from the owner of the school. He had another school, the Michigan School of Horseshoeing in Belleville, Michigan, somewhat near Ann Arbor, I would say, informing me that there weren't enough registrants for the course, but I like to go to Michigan free of charge. He would fly me down and fly me back. I said, okay, and that's the beginning of that part of the story. I ended up doing the course in Michigan and uh, finished it, came back, called farriers, tried to get a job, some training, and uh, that didn't work out so well. I got a lot of rejections. Times were different then. There, There were a lot of older farriers who were at the stage where they just didn't want to be bothered training anybody anymore. Or in one case, one gentleman was currently training both his uh, sons-in-laws, so he wasn't interested. So sometimes things just fall in place. There's a certain alchemy to life sometimes. I was offered a job. It's a bit of a story there, and I won't go into it because I don't want to get too sidetracked. Brian, you had asked me... uh, Has there been anything in this, in the earlier journey, that started out as a negative but turned into a positive? 
You're going to cover all my questions before I even well, get to ask them. <laughs> it's great. Well, there was, as it turns out. I got a job in the blacksmith shop at a historic site. I didn't really want the job. I applied for the job, and I wasn't hired. Four months later, the curator calls me and says, are you still interested? And I thought, oh, you know, I got a couple of clients now. You know? <laughs> but anyway, as it turns out, I did take the job. Well, I thought this was going to derail everything. I wouldn't be able to uh, be involved in music to the level that I wanted to be. And I wanted to be a farrier. I didn't want to work in the blacksmith shop just pounding steel and not shoeing horses. So the silver lining here, Brian, is that uh, it was the best thing ever. For four years, I lit a coal forge every day and pounded on steel, whether it's making shoes. We had a gift shop. We, I made things for the gift shop. We took custom orders for, oh, you know, fire dogs, uh, fireplace utensils. That was very big. I had hundreds of school kids coming through who all wanted a horseshoe nail finger ring. And uh, so I pounded those out by the hundreds. And during that four years, I gradually got out to the barns and was getting phone calls, and I was able to build my business over that four years. With a steady income. With a steady income, working in the forest. So uh, it was a blessing, as it turns out. Because by the time I decided to pull the plug on that, I was getting quite busy. I could afford to lose that, right. that income and move on to uh, shoeing full time. The end of that little story and my relationship with music, although that is still looms very large in my life, I fell in love with horseshoeing. It was an experiment that pleased me no end. The more I did it, the more I enjoyed it. And the more I enjoyed it, the more I wanted to know and the more I wanted to learn. You all know what that's like. We fall into that same pattern, which is why we're all here uh, to learn. That brings us up to date to that stage. Okay. Over to you, Brian. Well, so you're known now as a dressage farrier. Or that's kind of your specialty by reputation. How did you earn that title? It's not a moniker that I anointed myself with. I think the few times that I've heard it mentioned with any degree of recognition or, or respect, I was quite surprised. There were a few things that happened in my life, I guess, that coincided with, with that. I was doing a lot of uh, dressage horses. I had been working with a veterinarian a great deal, and she was really involved with the through a dressage riders, trainers. I started doing a lot of work with her. That opened doors to riders who were competing on the big tour. I got exposed to, to Olympians and uh, was forced enough to be able to shoe their horse. That coincided with uh, the 99 Pan Am Games in uh, Winnipeg, uh, which I went to, to shoe for my clients. I wasn't uh, accredited by the Pan Am Games, but I was flown out to shoe for my clients there, uh, where they were billeted off property. And uh, through the winter prior to that, I had been shoeing for a rider from uh, Columbia, and... Uh, he won individual silver. So, and it was actually his team captain that flew me out. That really helped things uh, grow in the dressage world. And then, of course, in uh, 2004, I was fortunate enough to go with the Canadian dressage team and our individual jumper uh, a rider who was uh, Mr. Miller, Ian Miller, to Athens to the Athens Olympics. So those things, I guess it buried in those experiences was the exposure that culminated in that reference. Built your reputation from there. For those of us who 
aspire to do that one day. First of all, what was the experience like? Sometimes you hear about being a team farrier, but then you just said like that you weren't the actual team farrier for the Pan Ams, but then they flew you in to do their own client horses. Does yes. that happen often? Because I can't imagine somebody switching farriers. Well, it, for an event like that, I think it happens to farriers fairly frequently when their clients are faced with having to use a farrier from another country, perhaps, that isn't uh, experienced with the peculiarities of their particular horse. Right, yeah. And that was true of, of the Olympics as well. The actual site farriers were farriers from uh, Australia. But any country that brought their own farrier, of course, would tend to their own affairs. But the workman, uh, was it workman? Kirkhart, uh, sponsored the blacksmith shop, which was a big tent with some beautiful big fans, wall of shoes and oh, tons of nails. And we could take our horses there and shoot. We were, had access to their forges and, uh, okay. and all of the shoes and everything. The countries that took their farriers flew in their hand tools and had access to the forges of the, uh, the site shop. Cool. To answer the other part of your question, the experience was awesome. It really was. It, I can't say enough about it. And, of course, it, if anyone can remember that particular Olympics in Greece, uh, Greece was not expected to rise to the occasion. But I'll tell you, when we uh, approached the equestrian site, there wasn't a lump of dirt out of place. There wasn't a piece of machinery. It was, they did an absolutely marvelous job. Can't say enough about the food and the free Heineken. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't think Greece is actually known for, but... <laughs> We'll move into the multi-farrier practice questions, and that was kind of the, the main point or how we advertised this particular podcast. You started, I think before anybody else tried to, a multi-farrier practice in Ontario, Canada, in a place where it wasn't a common idea. How did you do that? How did you structure it? What was the impetus to even start on that kind of an endeavor? It was... Um kind of happened organically. It grew, out of, it grew out of necessity. I didn't go into it with the plan of, oh, now I'm going to start a multi-person practice. I mean, you can't. A, a veterinarian can't do that. A farrier can't do that. You have to have a solid foundation to work with. My experience was when I went through a period when work was coming at me so fast, I really didn't know what to do with it. I was 10 years in before I hired my first helper. We got maxed out very, very quickly. So the options are, do I find a way to endeavor to grow my business, or do I start turning work away? Well, what kind of a businessman turns work away, right? So, so I said, well, I'm going to hire another guy. So now there's going to be three of us. So I hired a guy that had no experience. So that made my experienced guy sort of senior employee. The guy that I hired was the junior. So we now had... All the functions fully covered by three people. At the point at which the senior man is getting busier with his own career, as it now was perhaps cut back to four days a week, then three days a week, and then two days a week, the challenge was, well, we're all going to just have to work really hard to cover Sam's Tuesdays and Wednesdays when he's not here. Well, I didn't like that idea either. So I said, well, I'm going to hire another guy. So now there's four of us. So the senior man is still the senior man, but the junior man moves up a notch. He takes on more responsibilities. One of his responsibilities is to let this junior person shadow him and learn everything 
that he can possibly learn from the junior man. You know, for the first year, I was, I am very, if not demanding, I, I limit the amount, the, the speed at which people grow and experience. Because you have to be extremely good or proficient at job one before you're allowed to do job two. So I would take him on. He would sweep, lead horses, fetch and carry, do all these things. And one of the most important things for me is inventory. I want somebody other than me to know exactly what's going on with our inventory. What shoes we're plowing through the most, the nails, pads, whatever we might consume, the speed and the order in which we consume them. So he can come to me in the middle of the month and say, Barney, we're running low on combo nails and two and three fronts. We're okay with two and three hinds. So I want nothing to do with that. I want to be able to concentrate on, on my work. And my work with now four people in two trucks is prioritize. I can now choose what I want to think about it because second in command can na now nail these hind shoes on. Job one for man number two who is pulling clinching is I don't ever want to wait for a horse to be pulled. When I finish the horse I'm working on now, there better be a horse standing in the aisle with his shoes off and the floor swept. Things have to move like that when you're shoeing 25 horses a day around. You, there's no stopping. You work all the time, but it, there has to be a rhythm, a, a flow that never breaks. The guys watch, and they watch each other, so they learn how to anticipate what the next guy is going to need. So if I'm standing there and I've driven a nail in, and I don't like where it is, I might be overstating it, but I can put my hand out and somebody's gonna drop a crease nail puller in it. You know, it works that smoothly when it's working well. Follow up question, how are you still standing? <laughs> <laughs> 25 a day? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can ask our friend, uh, Justin Argent. Well, sometimes he is barely standing. He, he got the bejesus beaten out of him. But uh, he rose to the occasion, and he, he has become a very good farrier. For sure. But yes, uh, that's, that's not exaggerating. But if we're all in the same barn at the same time, it's nonstop, but nobody's really killing themselves because we all have a job to do. I'm shaping shoes, trimming the feet, shaping the shoes, and I may or may not be nailing them on. Second in command could very well that day nailing all the shoes on depending what's in front of us that day. Another advantage to the four is that there's always two trucks available. So if I've got five school trims down the road and a shoe off 10 kilometers away, I say to Joe, take Larry, you go and do those five trims, do the service, and we'll meet you at the main barn of the day. You should be there about 11 o'clock and we'll spend the rest of the day together. I don't think I personally ran a, a service for years because there was always somebody available to do it. <laughs> and that was their job, that was expected of them. If you're going to stay here and train here, you better be willing to go after work and nail a shoe on, or perhaps even a Saturday morning. I wasn't unreasonable about it. If I could, I would cut them loose early and say, you know, we, we have a service, it's about a 40 minute drive, so I'm gonna let you go at three o'clock. And, you know, they would take off and, and do it. So a lot of give and take in having a large crew. How would you manage customer expectations with something like that? The issue that we all run into when we take on employees is that they worry, what are they doing that you're not doing? and what if they mess up? Brian, I can't say that I haven't paid a price for that. I have. Mm -hmm. Some people don't like it, but that's okay. If they have a horse that they want me to tend to personally for whatever reason, 
then I'm more than glad to do that. Now, is that like with some kind of a surcharge to incentivize them using no. the whole crew? Okay. No, no, I'll do it if they are concerned. But to any large extent, that hasn't been my experience. It happened in such a, a gradual growth phase that my clients trusted my judgment. And indeed, I have more to lose than they do. You know, they might get a close nail, but what I have to lose is a very good client. Mm -hmm. So I instill in them a trust of the person I'm sending. And there's a selection system for that, too. Right. I'll take the senior man and I will allow him to be seen trimming the hind end of a horse or nailing the shoes on the school horses, for instance. And then I start sending him out to do all the services. So then six months or a year later, one day when I'm in the barn and I choose to let him nail the front shoes on one of their better horses, say, oh, that's Joe. He's, he's the guy that comes and services all the horses. Right. You just so, build that trust over time. So there's an education for the clients in yeah. that. They have to be trained very slowly to accept, accept the person you trust. But you instill in them a confidence in your level of professionalism that if I can trust this man, so can you. Invariably, there were probably mistakes at some point sure. made by them. How do you approach that situation with the client? Like, did you ever have a client say, okay, from this point on, I only want you nailing on shoes if there was a hot nail or... I have. And, and not a lot, but I have. And uh, the way you have to handle it, or my experience and I have no regrets, is that every time something went sideways in a barn, my fault. I put up my hand, I'm really sorry, we've had a problem here, tell them what to do, this one's on me. However, you know, you have to read your clients, you have to know them, and you may come up with a different solution for each client. You know, you don't paint them all with the same brush and treat them all the same way. Much like the people that work for you, they're all individuals, and you have to learn how to treat them in their lane. But the beginning of then and end of all of that is I always take full responsibility for anything that happens in the barn when the horse is under your care and you're the boss. It's your fault. In our conversation before we did the interview, you had told me you were really hesitant to call them apprentices. Could you explain that? Yeah, I can explain that. It has to do with the fact that we don't have an apprenticeship program in Canada to train farriers. That's the main reason. You know, they're trainees. They're my employees. I hire them to help me shoe horses. And not even with the full understanding that I'm going to train them how to shoe horses. It's always a five-year commitment. If you can't commit to me for five years, we can't even start a conversation. So if you commit for five years and pay attention, at the end of those five years, you'll know how to shoe horses, I guarantee it. I can't tell you that there's a program in which this happens and there's steps that you have to follow. You just come to work every day, and not only will you uh, know how to shoe horses when you're finished, you'll have a business. Everyone that has worked with me has a very good business. Mm. But you have to stay long enough to do that. You know, this isn't a six-month commitment to the boss. You're not going to learn anything. And I certainly agree with being aware and watching how other farriers do things. That's what these conventions and clinics and wet labs are for, is to see how the other world works. And did you require that out of your helpers? Like that, that they come to these yes. things? Yeah. Yes. Why isn't Justin here today, then? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a hockey game in his day today. I'm just kidding. Yeah. And a few other things. So I don't refer th to them, or I don't often refer to them as apprentices, because in Canada, we don't have a, a, a program that is theory and practicum, like an electrician or uh, even a lawyer, for God's sakes. You just come to work for a farrier, and, and he teaches you. There should be another program. We're doing maybe a little bit better. I think, you know, the AFA has 
perhaps set the industry standard by their particular certification programs. But sadly, there still isn't a province in Canada or, as far as I know, a state in the U.S. that recognizes any certification as, as an industry standard. As a requirement. As a requirement to, to, to a practice in that state. Sad state of affairs when you think that people who cut human fingernails have to be licensed in every state, I believe, of the United States. And that was my second career. And their hours that they put in are almost equivalent to the number of hours offered in farrier schools. But when they're done, they're licensed yeah, by the state. Right. And there's tremendous reciprocity from state to state, too where it's you know, recognized is recognized or wide. you write their state board exams or something like that. Maybe I'm offering up a weak example. I'm just saying that we don't have that and we should. That would give us a, some framework to establish an apprenticeship program that is recognized as such. Now, with your five-year commitment, was that a written contract or just a handshake and yeah. an agreement yeah. that Informal. way? Yeah, how did you decide that this person was worthwhile spending five years with? What was that process like? Well, certainly some aptitude with tools helps. You do a ride-along, as many as you want, but if we're getting close to some sort of a commitment, you're sitting in the truck, in my truck, beside me, for at least a week, unpaid, and if I don't want to slap you at the end of seven days... Then we can have a conversation about where we're going next. But it's all about personality. You can train almost anybody to shoe horses if they have any kind of handy hands at all. But you can't train them to be a good guy. You know, it has to start as a personal relationship first, as far as I'm concerned. So that was always my onboarding prerequisite was that we like each other. What were some of the qualities that you would see within that week that you would recognize as either a pro or a con for somebody like that? Well, we would certainly start pulling shoes. You know, I might even say, you see how he's drilling that heel cock hole? I'd like you to do a couple. I just want to watch him with his, watch his hands and see if he can pick up the tools and, and learn how to use them properly. That's it. You know, reading this personality her. I've not had uh, gals work for me, and there's no reason. No one's just asked. <laughs> it's never, it's just never been my, my personal experience. They haven't heard you sing before. <laughs> <laughs> How would you work out your numbers for employee compensation? I imagine that would have been a bit of a learning curve when you first started. Like, how, well, when you it, take on four people. Yeah, that's tough. So that's where the 25 horses a day come in. <laughs> you, you have to be doing numbers. Right. There's, no, there's no way to do it. And did you have a specific number that you had in your head that you knew you had to do to justify that? Or is it a leap of faith, we'll take on this other person and hopefully it works out? More that, Brian? Yes. You know, you always have to make sure that you have a thick enough book that even if you have a bad day... You pay the guys. What, you know, I always paid per diem, not an hourly rate. If I've got a serious appointment or a family emergency and I have to leave at noon and it's a, just a situation where they can't work because I have to go home, everybody still has to get paid. They've made the commitment of that day, so everybody still gets paid. First man on board would make the most money. The new guy coming in at the bottom would make the least amount of money, and the other guys in between would probably make the same. There's some variances in that. Again, you have to remember that I am paying four guys, and they're probably not working as hard as if they went out with you on their own and did a, a full day, and right. you had to do 10 horses between two people. I think everyone understood that they were getting paid to be educated. And so they better keep their monetary expectations in check because <laughs> there's only so much to go around, and I want a lot of it. <laughs>
Well, and that kind of leads perfectly into this next question. Where did all of your business savvy come from? Was that you learned as you went or do you have education in it? That's a tough question. I'm, I don't know that I had a lot of business savvy. I had a hunger to survive in the business and do better than just okay. I wanted to do really well financially. So when there were association, Canada, United States, uh, Farrier Association meetings, and they had any business workshops, I would attend those just to get some ideas. One of the ideas was that my employees all have to be subcontracts. Otherwise, in Canada, you're going to get hooped by WSIB. You'll drown in that. I had a very good and productive conversation with WSIB, and they declared me exempt. Yeah, I found that out too. Yes. So we're good. But you want to leave a very good trail on that. And so you want your little guy to get his first client as quick as possible. So if you've got a few backyard trims, start passing them on to the new kid. Because he needs his own tools, he needs his own truck. He needs to be driving to work every day in his truck using his tools, writing you an invoice and getting a T4 slip at the end of the year. Oh, okay, right. This is along that line of business questions. What have you done to set yourself up for retirement? Well, you can see I'm still working. Yes. <laughs> so I don't know how well that's going. <laughs> you know, I, when I started, I immediately uh, started an RSP plan and I paid into it I'll be 43 years in in November November 26th I finished the Michigan School of Horseshoeing and uh, so I've been accumulating that for those years not that I was able to max out every year but I have been doing that and I bought my first home Flipped that two years later and did well on that, invested in another home, paid that off quickly, and took some equity and bought a farm. So it's been kind of real estate for me and RSPs. Having said that, pick the plan of your choice, but pick something, because nobody's going to do it for you. It might be advisable to find a spouse that uh, is employed with a good retirement and medical plan. <laughs> so that would be my advice on that. Two farriers in the family, I don't think, is a good idea. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> uh, what advice would you have for somebody who's just getting started out as an apprentice in this business? Be here. Come to these. Come to the conventions. Get educated. Read read, read. Start a library. I mean, you. we have the Google library now. There's tons of stuff there, but there's lots of misinformation as well. But there's nothing like flipping paper, sitting down and contemplating this problem that you know you're going to have to face tomorrow, and you don't have enough experience to just pull it out of thin air. Right. You do have to reference something. So for me, it was starting a library, attending workshops as much as I could. You know, that is a must. Uh, you have to start that. Most of the uh, programs have apprenticeship or student rates, so they can come cheaper. And if you're a nice boss, you'll pay his or her way anyway. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about that. Just get them there. Right. And tell your clients that, oh, you know what we're doing this weekend? You, so you slip that into conversation. You always want your clients to know that you're educating yourself. That's uh, really good for business. Now, five to ten years in as a farrier, that's when you were really starting to take off. What advice would you have for somebody at that point? Well, at five years, you don't know what you don't know. Between five years and ten years, those are the problem years. You screw up a lot in those years, <laughs> guaranteed. <laughs> so pull back. Start examining what you're doing, how you're doing it. The rate at which you've lost clients and why— and you will use all these negative experiences, like losing a good client, as a question to yourself, what could I have done differently to avoid this situation? 
how could I have not lost this client? It is my fault. And if it isn't, I'm going to find something in there to learn from it anyway. Yeah, that's the toughest part of the yeah. that process. Yeah, the it morning is. process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the more, <laughs> that's right. And at ten years, ten years is a dangerous time because you do have some chops. So you need to start looking at yourself. You need to start taking education even more seriously because by ten years you could be very, very busy and not taking the time to examine what you're doing and just riding on your reputation and your whatever laurels you may have achieved or accumulated along the way. So again, at every stage, it's always looking inward and looking back. See where you came from so you have a better idea of where you're going to go. Right. Lifestyle is also part of this. Not everybody wants a booming horseshoeing career. They want a balance in life. I wanted a big booming career, so I went for it. And uh, I was fortunate, but as I said earlier in the conversation, Brian, you know, I, I paid a price. Not everybody was happy with my decisions, but I made that choice based on wanting to be in it for the long haul. I wanted to be the age I am and still able, able to, to shoot, <laughs> still be able to shoot horses every day if I chose to. If you're pumping out a dozen horses a day, combinations of fours, fronts, trims, then you're doing that five, six days a week. It's going to take the muscle right out of you. It really is. So you have to find a way to either pace yourself or set up a business that will allow you to share the workload. And I love sharing the workload. <laughs> Well, that's the end of the interview questions. Thank you very much for doing that, Barney. This You're has welcome. been great. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Do you guys want to do the audience questions? Oh, we've got an audience question already. I just had a question about your home life when you're trying to be a superstar at the same time and how you found that balance and if there was any bumps along the road that may have caused you to derail that part? And how did you deal with all of this? It was a 35-year bump. <laughs> there is no balance. You have to choose. If balance is what you want, then that's a lifestyle mm -hmm. choice. You have to create that work environment for yourself. If you have chosen to do a circuit horses, then if somebody calls you, loading the trailer Friday night and they pull a shoe, you better get in your truck and go put that shoe on. Or Saturday morning or Sunday morning, just as you're sliding on your golf shoes. You don't. You take them off and put your boots on and you get in the truck and you go and do it. So without being facetious, depending on what you want, there is no balance if you're going at it full bore and you want to be an international level Farrier, it's that or something else. But I don't see that you can have both and keep everybody smiling. Mm -hmm. Sad, but true. I just wondered how you did it. In how I did it? To get, yeah, for you, like you're 43 years in. So I was, I was pretty selfish about it. Mm -hmm. And which isn't to say that I was inconsiderate. I was just focused. So everything else around my life got slotted in where it could be slotted in, whether it was marriage, kids, holidays. I did try and, and have tried to take a week in the summer and a week in the winter. That's family time. I have paid a price for that too. But again, if, you're, if you have help that you trust, then you can disappear for a week and your world isn't going to fall apart. You may just have one guy on service calls only and then two other guys that are going out and just doing the bare necessities. You're not going to give them your best horses to shoe when you're not there. You know, you could have a, a dozen school horses that have to get done this week. So you send them out to do that. Yeah, you have to create your own balance. There were many difficult times. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
So my question, which might not come as a surprise, is regarding the business side of a multifarrier practice. How have you found the business side of a multifarrier practice uh, different from uh, just a single practice? Um, I guess one particular that I would be personally interested in is with uh, regards to profit margins. Do you find it better or worse? Um, do you find that it's, uh, it's easier to rack up expenses or is it easier to be more efficient with a multifarrier practice? Well, you can certainly be more efficient from the standpoint of having the ability to prioritize how your day is spent. So I could spend two hours working on a crack while the other guys are at the other end of the barn or in a different a grooming stall or something, pounding out the horses that we have on the to-do list. As far as remuneration goes... If your employees aren't milking, <laughs> milking you dry, the more horses you shoe, the more money you're going to make. That's really all there is to it. There is a tipping point, though. Brian and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, you know, it's like having, as I explained to him, it's, it's a numbers game. Shoeing 15 horses in a day isn't necessarily better than shoeing 12 horses a day financially. You know, I always paid guys overtime. They had a per diem plus overtime. So now if you're going into late day and those extra two horses are getting eaten up in overtime wages, then it's not worthwhile to do that. But by and large, I, would, I think to answer your question, there is value in, in numbers. You have to be pricing appropriately as well. You know, it's very difficult to charge, you know, 15 or $20 to trim a horse when you're paying somebody 40 extra dollars to put in an extra half hour at the end of the day. But it has been my experience that my bank account always looks better the more horses I do. Is that good? If you're shoeing horses at that level, you must have traveled. Did you have a formula for how you uh, assign costs to customers for that travel? So if you're shoeing horses in your area, it would cost X. And then if you were to travel out of your area, would you charge? I determine the number of horses I have to do beforehand. I determine my expenses, and then I do a flat rate per horse. On top of the flat rate, say uh, my expenses are going to be $4,000, and I've got 30 horses to do, then I split that $3,000 between the 30 horses, and that goes on top of the flat shoeing rate. That's kind of been the way I've, I've done that. When you have employees and they start taking over more of the tasks where the client trusts them more, I'm sure at some point you might have lost clients to your employees. I know some places they will establish things with a contract or something to make sure that that kind of thing doesn't happen. Was that an experience that you had and, and were there ways that you learned to avoid it or, or was that just a natural progression that you kind of assumed? Farriers are a bugger that way, huh? <laughs> They'll take your work. Yeah. They will. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> you know, we don't have a non-compete that would hold water. So that's what you would think of normally if you were, had any other kind of a business. I'm sure that uh, veterinarians protect their practice that way when somebody goes out on their own. But I've never done that. I rely on the integrity of my employees and the integrity of my clients not to shoot me in the foot. But I can say with all honesty... They both have. Yeah. <laughs> it happens. You know, I try to be fair and very giving with clients that come in as well. You know, giving the guys work to do that I don't want or can't do. You know, I've got this call that come in. You're, you know, you've, you're taking Mondays off now. And I know that you're trying to fill up your Saturdays and your Mondays. So this is out your way. Why don't you take this little barn? So... If they can see some generosity in that kind of a gesture, I hope that they will be generous to me when my favorite client goes to them and says, I am sick to death of paying Barney's rates. Can you do it any cheaper? Pick me, pick me. You know, so... 
people are people. You can't, and they're all trying to establish a business of their own. I'm digressing a little bit, but you know, you have to consider the familial needs of the guys and gals that work for you. And they all have different needs, and you have to take that into consideration. So sometimes I'm less insulted when things like that happen. For I can give you an example without giving names. Uh, one uh, guy that was with me for 10 years, I shod his mother's barn for ever. But as soon as he was competent, she just called me and said, oh, I'm going to let my son do my horses from now on. Well, I was disappointed and hurt and insulted. And it's an interesting thing. After all these years, I still take this so personally. I have literally cried when I've lost clients because I was so hurt that they would do that. And I never get over it. I never get over it. It hurts as much today, if it was to happen today, as it would would have 20 years ago. Oh, good. So we have that to look forward to. <laughs> I was hoping that part would get easier. Some guys and gals have a thicker skin than I do. I just, yeah. Yeah, you put your blood, I'm sweat, and tears baby. literally into it. and Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Well, thank you very much, Barney. I see a lot of tired faces here today. So thanks, guys, for sticking it out with us. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the opportunity. This portion of the podcast is called the Stratum Tectorium. These are the short answer, surface stuff questions, but it's okay if the guest wants to go deeper. The Stratum Tectorium is the outermost layer of the hoof wall. The thin layer of cells, also known as the hoof varnish or the stratum externum. Maybe you just learned a new word. I hope you learned some interesting facts about our guest too. Enjoy. Okay, so these are the short answer questions. You can go in in depth as much as you want, but you don't have to. Uh, your favorite book, most gifted to others? Robertson Davies, Fifth Business. Okay. Uh, favorite brand of work boots? Timberlands. Favorite make of rasp? Save Edge. What is your dream farrier rig, and do you own it? My dream farrier rate? Rig. Rig. Oh, right. Man, That's a oh good man. question. I can hardly <laughs> wait to get into that. Well, my favorite rig for was the one I had for a long time. I'm in a little trailer right now. Is that the big blue truck? Yes, the big blue truck. It was a Ford F-350 with a custom-made box. It was made by uh, a fabricator in Truro, Nova Scotia. Oh, really? <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, he did a wonderful job. He made horse trailers, and that was his first uh, rig, but it became his template for farrier rigs and, and bet trucks on the East Coast. Your favorite rounding hammer? The one I'm using now, which is almost as old as I am. I don't even know the make of it. <laughs> <laughs> gas or diesel truck? I'm in gas now. I prefer diesel. Favorite pastime after work? My guitar and a glass of wine. Next thing on your bucket list? Oh, that's a good one. I like playing golf. So it's always been my dream road trip to play every province in the country. Oh, that's cool. So I, I played, I played a few. Pro. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite brand of keg shoe? I mix it up a bit, but primarily uh, Kirkhart. Kirkhart DFs? Or, yep. Yeah. Leather or synthetic pads? Leather. Why? Because they breathe, they're natural, they're wonderful for bad shelly feet. Uh, they have a therapeutic quality that almost seems like it shouldn't exist, but it does. I feel like I shouldn't ask that question anymore. Nobody has ever said rubber or, or synthetic. Favorite type of horse to work on? And don't tell me a good one. <laughs> so you asking for a brand name? Sure. <laughs> I like working on sport horses. I like working on athletic horses, whether they're dressage or jumpers. Ideal number of horses to shoe all around in one day on your own. Really? Yeah. On my own? Yeah. <laughs> or does it have to be with help? I, yeah, if I had two horses to shoe, it would take me two days on my own. <laughs> um, I have changed how 
I work and live my life a great deal over the last short while. I work only with my son now. Okay. And I like to shoe five, six, seven horses around. And your favorite anvil? Well, I used a mankle for years. I have a Scott in the shop and a future on my truck. So Don't not, know how to answer that. You're not loyal. <laughs> Favorite inspirational quote, if you have one. There's so many, I don't think I do. I thought for sure you'd have one. We can go back to that if you want. Okay. What brand of accounting software do you use if you use one? QuickBooks. App that has most improved your work life? Oh, the ability to receive radiographs is a game changer for veterinarians and fears. It changed everything. In fact, Having a cell phone changed everything. <laughs> I, this was a first for me, Brian. I was the first farrier to have a cell phone. Really? And, uh, and so there's, there's a, a little bit of a story to this. So I'm not going to go into it in a big way. I was playing at the Mariposa Folk Festival many, many years ago. And all of the local talent was given a book of tickets to sell for a free cell phone. And it was the old ones that looked like a military field phone <laughs> with the, the power, best signal, power box that went underneath the seat. Well, that's what it was. But I was too damn lazy and cheap to sell the tickets, so I just bought them all myself. <laughs> and I won. <laughs> <laughs> so Amazing. I was suddenly the first hooked-up uh, farrier in the area. And you probably regretted that ever since. Well, you know what? <laughs> I used to go home every night, which was part of the lump in my road, uh, and spend two hours on the phone, returning phone calls, scheduling. It was crazy. Now I've got all that done before I get home, which isn't to say I don't feel calls at home, but it's nothing like it was back before we had a cell phone. Do you have a preferred social media platform? I don't engage in social media. I'm connected, so I eavesdrop. He's but a voyeur. I, but I do not post. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> do you have injury insurance? Yes. What do you use as your planner or agenda? I use day timers, paper. I have a, a to-do book and a what actually gets done book. Okay. Now, other than your guitar and wine, what is your favorite method of soothing aches and pains? Oh, we don't need to go there. <laughs> 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 Foot pedaling. <laughs> this is. This is <laughs> uh, <laughs> fa favorite brand of jeans? Uh, Levi's. Favorite drink? Pinot Grigio. Favorite genre of music? Um, scruffy country, roots country. Do you work out? I do. I shoe a lot of horses. No, I. <laughs> I, I'm, I have a very strict uh, morning program, and so I do stretches, exercises, and includes a little bit of uh, lifting uh, for 20 minutes every morning. That seems to be a really common answer. With and, I, and I have an inverter, and I hang upside down on it every morning before I start and every day after I finish. And it's the best $500 I've ever spent on health care. I, I got one, you, too, yeah, just recently. It's yeah. wonderful. Do you meditate? I do. Is that part of your morning routine? No. No, it's part of my, I wish to hell I could fall asleep routine. Oh, okay. <laughs> and what would you have been if not a farrier? Um, I probably would have continued to pursue music. Garth Brooks' competition. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. You're welcome, and sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all very much. Before I let you go, I wanted to say a few words about the AAPF the American Association of Professional Farriers. They also have an international and Canadian version, although they all have the same board of directors. I have friends on both the Canadian and American side of things. Kathy Lesbros and Dave Farley are both members of the board and both have been guests on the podcast. They reached out a few weeks ago to offer CE credits for listening to the podcast and I was very thrilled with the opportunity to be associated with them. 
I'm a long-standing proud member of the American Farriers Association and earned my accreditation through them, but now I am joining up with the AAPF as well. They are also offering many great programs for farriers, including one for farriers who are hurt or sick and unable to do their normal work where they get other members to help them out. There are many educational programs that they are offering, and they have their own accreditation process as well. I really think that it's important for any farrier to become a member of either the AFA or the AAPF, as it is an opportunity to become part of something bigger than yourself. It's a great way to network. It's a great way to learn more about the industry and learn more about the stuff that's coming out of the research that's being done so that you can just always do a better job for the horses that are in your care. So please have a look at their website. There's lots of information there about the programs they're offering and the ways you can sign up and become a member. And sign up. Hope you all have a great day. Take care of yourselves and each other out there. Thank you for listening.